Hi guys. I've been thinking I've got some projects coming up that's going to need various voltages, including being able to generate a negative voltage from a positive voltage. And this is where buck regulators come in. And this particular chip, the LM2596, is actually been around for quite a long time. It is cheap. These Chinese copies actually like for four bucks you can get ten of them that's like 40 cents a piece and i thought we would give these a, a, a try and see how well they might work and in order to do this we will have to build a, a little pc board because we are not going to be able to plug these into a breadboard on account that they have feedback and uh, there would there is potential for oscillations and things and we need to filter out the higher frequencies that it generates and so on so as ripple so a PCB is a necessity here because it is part of the circuit in any case I thought we would attempt that and see how hard it is to actually do that and we can compare what our results with some of those Chinese boards that have these things on them as well in any case, I thought I will put these videos together and put them in a view list and we can go to this process together and learn from each other. If anyone has any comments, please put them in the comment section. And so let's have a look what we what information we can gather to develop the circuit and so on. If you look into that uh, chip, see it's been around since November 1999. And <clears throat> TI desperately wants you to use a newer product because obviously they would make more profit on that, I guess. Perhaps it is probably better, but it also has more pins and it's, it's, this one is 400 kilohertz. So any case, we're going to be using this older one because it's cheap and readily available. And how it actually works is this is a detailed overview here. Um, it can have an input range of up to 40 volts. It can deliver up to th 3 amps. There are fixed versions available. That's 3.3 volts, 5 volts, and 12 volts and an adjustable version of course we are going to be dealing with the adjustable version so this is a little diagram of uh, what's inside the chip and it has a on off input if it is low below 1.23 volts or something like that it um, is on anything over that it is off so we're going to tie that pin to ground and not worry about it we don't have to turn it off at all uh, it's a bipolar device it's uh, obviously it has like a bunch of transistors there and uh, uh, connected together for the output and it has a feedback mechanism here there's a voltage divider here and the one we are using is going to be the adjustable one and this voltage divider will have to be outside the chip uh, as you can see here like um, for the adjustable one R2 is 0 ohms and R1 is open so in other words R1 doesn't exist and R2 is connected uh, like 0 ohms so you can think of it as the, the negative input of this comparator here to go directly to the feedback in and then outside we will actually have this voltage divider to, to uh, set the voltage so this data sheet actually has the uh, application notes attached to it which is good and it's telling us that you need to make sure which is true for all switch mode power supplies that you have low ESR capacitors either 
ordinary electrolytics or tantalums. And this is very important with twitch mode power supplies because as you saw, this thing is running at 150 kilohertz. So the output actually has 150 kilohertz, uh, usually like a, similar to a square wave or some sort of waveform coming out of it, which has to be filtered by the output capacitor and the inductor and um, the diode that actually is there to rectify it so that it is just positive. You need special ones high quality ones that are actually designed for that. And this data sheet actually has a list of capacitors that are actually uh, suitable uh, somewhere in the data sheet that they are recommending. And if you look at some of the data sheets on the capacitors, they have like a, an RMS voltage or something like that that they can handle and you have to make sure that they fit that Uh, what you're using them for. So, lots of discussion about this ESR thing. So obviously the the capacitors are very important. They have to be close to the chip. You have to make sure that the in this is that the inductance, the magnetic field from the inductor doesn't interfere with the feedback mechanism, traces, resistors, and so on. And the traces on the PCB have to be very large so that they don't have much resistance and so on. So that's that's the tricky bit of these um, buck regulators. This here is a figure there where you can see that depending on the load, I'm actually not planning to draw more than, than maybe an amp or an amp and a half. And 12 volts is kind of perhaps that we're aiming at. So um, we are somewhere between the 47 to 68 microhenry. So I'm going to use a 68 microhenry one uh, for the inductor. Um, here is a, a table of inductors that um, obviously they tried and, and, and work. And <clears throat> this is a discussion here of the traces, the, the fat lines here on this uh, little circuit, you have to make sure that they are, you know, low resistance. And another warning here about keeping the feedback wiring away from the inductor flux. And you can, if you want to have a, a really clean output, you can actually put an extra filter on the end of it. You can use a three microhenry uh, inductor and a a capacitor there on the output as well, which we may have to do or may not. So we will we will have a look what we end up with, with just with the standard circuit. There are standard versions of this uh, uh, chip that actually already are set up to develop 3.35 volts or 12 volts, but um, we have the adjustable one, as we said. Anything else there of note? The diodes that work, you have to use a, a Schottky diode with a short reverse recovery time. And we're gonna be using a 2N 58, 22 actually, has a little bit higher. It's in, in there somewhere. Oh, there it is, one N5822 is what we are going to use. Some information here about the uh, circuit. Uh, the it, it says there if you use more, the R1 is approximately 1K ohm. Um, <clears throat> input and output, 68 microhenries, which is actually what we have chosen. Um, we've got a 1N5825. We've got 1K ohm and 
this particular little capacitor here you need if it is over 10 volts. They discussed it in here somewhere. These are these are the uh, if you really want to calculate stuff, that's where you can do it from. Any case, what we have come up with is so this is roughly what we want to do. Um, I highlighted here the areas where I want to make sure that the traces are thick with those thick lines here and I have chosen a 10 nanofarads plus or minus for this little capacitor here this is actually going to be a trim pot not a resistor and this is going to be 1k I'm going to put a 680 microfarad I was planning to use but I don't think what I've actually found here is a 560 microfarad, which is actually going to be used. But um, I, I don't have a 680 microfarad at the right voltage and with a low ESI that I can use here. But anyway, 470 microfarad upwards uh, said it was good, so I should be okay with that. Um, I don't have a 220 microfarad capacitor of. Um, the voltage should be at least one and a half times V out and if I want this thing to run up to let's say 20 volts then I should have a 30 volt capacitor all my capacitors I have a 25 volts now 25 volts it would probably be okay but um, but I did find two capacitors that I can put in parallel with the right voltage and, uh, and low ESI so that's what I'm going to do and we are now about to feed that circuit into the schematic editor of KiCad. KiCad is some free software that you can uh, download from the internet. There will be a link in the uh, description below. And it also generates, we will be using it to generate the PCB. And as you can see, it has a schematic editor and a PCB editor, which is pretty much um, all we're going to be using in this software for, the, for this particular exercise. Uh, some of these features here are to do with if you want to order PCBs you know, from PCB manufacturers, you need a Gerber file and all sorts of stuff. And um, we are not going to be doing that. We're going to be making our own. So that's that so I have already gone in and if you click this uh, file button you can actually say new project and then you would give it a name and I've, I've called it I've it's I've already done that so I called it buck reg and um, I stuck it in a folder there and <clears throat> these are the files here that it, that it has so we, from here we can go into the schematic editor okay so we are going to be first thing we do is we add the connectors for the input and the output I'm going to set it up so we can use these little type of um, probably can't see it very well but the little, little little tiny connector here like that if we don't want to use it we can still we can just uh, we put the pads on for it and we can just solder the wires to it as well that'll be okay but let's put them in in any way we click this button over here and we want a connector so we will say we can just put in con and we want this is what we want yep double click it and we will just put it over here for now and i think i better make this a little bit larger you can actually select this whole thing like that do a control c or you can right click and say copy but i'm going to do control c then i'm going to do a control v so now i've got two of them 
So this is one is going to be the input and the other one's going to be output. So we can double click that and this let's say that this is J1. And we can click that and we say input J2. output and another thing you got to do is to tell it when, when by the time we get to the P, to, to the PCB it has to know what the footprint of it is so we can actually right click it oh we have to select it first right click it and go to the E for properties edit properties and as you can see there is a footprint there and then you can go to the footprint editor and obviously i don't know what this is but it uh, doesn't know so we can filter and we can actually well we can see already there's connectors here and now the connector that i normally use is let me see now i have to go to the i've got a some footprints that i that i use and i, I put them in this little text file here and this connector actually is what what we want to use so I'm going to actually copy and if we we can actually we can actually just paste that in there So now if we actually go there you you will see it. That's that's what it is. That's what that little that little white connector, that's what that that's what that is. Goes like like this. Anyway, so that is selecting the uh, footprint. So I can say okay and We'll do the same thing to this one here. I wonder why that doesn't work. It says E is properties. Yeah. Okay, so we got those two done. So now let's have a look. Um, the LM259 or whatever it is. Okay. Let's have a look if we can find the LM259. Two, five, nine, six. And we want the adjustable one. That's the one. Okay, we've got that. Now we want a resistor. Now this particular one, it already has, I believe, Yeah, the footprint's already there, see? Because uh, somebody um, has even got a link to the data sheet and all that kind of stuff. Somebody's already put that in there in the uh, library, so we don't have to worry about that. You can 
reduce that a little bit in size so we can see a bit more. All right, so another component, and this one's going to be an ordinary resistor. And this particular one is going to be uh, a one k resistor, which is actually an SMD component. Now, let me enlarge this and I, I show you how I do that. Okay, so just to um, show how, how you can work out the sizes of these components, I have one of these little rulers, if you like. It says here, um, one PCB to ruler them all. <laughs> and it has different sized pads on there, so you can match them up with, with your components. And um, so you know what to select in the footprint. So what I do is this particular one here, um, I've got these two SMD components that I've got to fit. And this is the resistor. And the resistor actually would fit on 0805 pads if they were manufactured, you know, uh, at, at the factory. But I always use a, the next size up of pads. See, like I put it on the 1206 over here. And uh, maybe I can zoom in a little bit so you can see. So the shoulders are actually of the pads are, st are sticking out a little proud of the of the chip, and that's what we want for hand soldering. And likewise, this capacitor over here is particularly tiny and it would fit on a 0603 pad uh, in fact but we're going to be using a 0805 and the pads are quite wider than what the chip is but it's still they're still narrow enough uh, the gap between narrow enough to, to hold the chip properly, but it makes it much easier, especially this tiny one, to solder it from the outside. So that's what we're going to be using. So the capacitor is going to be, we're going to select zero, 0805, and for the resistor, we're going to select 1206. That's, that's how uh, I determine the sizes of these things, by using this little ruler. Okay, so therefore the footprint we are going to use 1206 for the resistor. And as I said, I already have rather than, than look them up in the library, I have them on that in that text file so I'm just going to copy and paste them and there is a hand solder version of that <clears throat> which is what we want so that's done so now we want to do the um, let's do the little capacitor we will just put in C on polarized capacitor, yeah, sounds good. And we're going to be properties again footprint, and we've got what have I got that capacitor? No, actually, I I have only a larger one. So in this case, I do have to to find it in the library. The little text file doesn't have it, so. <clears throat> okay. 
and it's going to be see i put ca in capacitor smd um it is not an electrolytic There should be a C805, there it is. And let's select the one that is hand solder. Yeah, that's the one. Okay. So we got that. Now um let's do the trim pot here we want a trim potentiometer this trimmable resistor here, I don't know what that is, but it only has two, two. Let us plonk it over there for now. And we want the one that seems to fit it I don't have I got um, just some cheap trimmer trimmers you know from uh, in, in a box from the Aliexpress and I don't know what brands they are but they have three legs on them that are all five millimeters apart and I found that there is a a Bourne's or some sort of a, a version of it that actually fits it so that is what we are going to be using I just went into the library and when you go into the library it gives you the footprint over there let me turn that off temporarily so you can see it better then you can actually go to this ruler over here and you can click on a location like uh, this pin over here and then you can move down to the other pin and you see it's exactly five millimeters why five millimeters and you can do the same thing with over over here, um, and, and that, so you can determine if that if that if that's uh, if that fits. So and it does. So that's that's how we find out if we got the correct footprint. <clears throat> okay. So that one is done. So let me put the other camera back. Um, capacitors let's do the input capacitor here and it's going to be the a different footprint we're going to be using this capacitor here and we need to know the size of it and it is 15 millimeters diameter and the legs are Eight millimeters apart, and what did I say? 15, 15 millimeters. Yeah, it's quite a, a chunky one. All right. So let's do that one. Capacitor. And it is actually a polarized capacitor. Oh.
Okay, so it's not under C. Maybe if I put in cap. It's a quirky thing with this uh, KiCad. You just sometimes you just can't find things. Oh, it is there. C polarized. What's the difference? U U.S. symbol. I think that I like that one better. Okay. So now we can go to properties, footprint, and we're looking for capacitor. So, and this is going to be true hole, and it's actual. And we're looking at not actual radio. We're looking at fifteen millimeters, but the pins are eight millimeters. Do we have such a thing? See you can actually Create your own radio. I think that's probably close enough. That's what we'll have to go for. 16 millimeters and pin seven and a half millimeters. I kind of looked like it looked like eight millimeters, but this is not very accurate. And perhaps it is seven and a half millimeters. And the size of it. Actually, probably is 16 millimeters. So that's probably exactly what it is. All right, that's good. Uh, this is going to be C1, so I want to set that now so we know what it is. And it is a, it is actually a 560 microfarad. All right. Let's name these things to get it done. Twenty K. I'm going to call that one C three.
Okay. And let's do the diode. Well, let's do the uh, actually. We can copy and paste. And this one becomes C2. And it's going to be 220. But the footprint's going to be different. Actually, we would we were going to use two capacitors there because we don't have a single one. So let's let's call this C two A. We're going to have two different footprints, and A is going to be one hundred and eighty microfarads. Anyway, so I think I will finish putting the rest of the components on um, offline because it's uh, kind of slow and boring. And when I've got them all on, we will go and um, connect them together. Okay, so. We have all the components that we need, just about. There's a few more. So let's start laying this out. Move that over there. Now, this capacitor is going to be on the input, for good measure, we will put a hundred nano a pads for a hundred nanofarad capacitor, just in case we find that we need it. Let's move these a little bit closer so that they can be kind of next to each other. Like so. All right. It's going to be closer. So now we can actually go to the wiring section and you kind of click on the points that you want to connect together. Those for now. And now what we need to do is to go over here with that little earth symbol on the side. And We want power and we want ground. Yeah, we'll connect it up like that for now. And we also want to tell the system that um, something like VCC or something like that. That one will do. I have to hit escape to get or hit the arrow there. Uh, 
so we'll give that a label it's going to be power one and we want that somewhere there is an option to um you're not under properties maybe that's what it is yeah that's what we want we don't want that um, nonsense over there okay so we got let's do the same treatment for this one properties doink doink and I don't know I think you need to put a different number in there power two or something I always forget these things I do know that you also have to go over here and there should be a flag I think it's called power flag yes and you need to put that on where the input for the power is it's a um, a weird thing about uh, keycad and what i do is i um i turn that off so oh, it's just like a little jigger over there and you got to do the same thing with the ground no oh, this should be okay let's first connect it together Yeah, let's move this one over so it is in line and Looks like we have to uh, clear a bit of space for us, but we'll do that in a second. So now we should be able to go, I think, G for a drag. Okay, so that should do it. So now we should be able to refer to VDC and ground in the rest of the circuit. So let's get this guy somewhere over here. Let's move some of these things away. Sometimes when you click on things, it doesn't, you can't drag them, it comes up until you go N for move. All right.
paste All right, so okay, let me turn down that. Right. All right, so let's have a look. Uh, a resistor, we have got that. Resi I mean, capacitor is over here. We have pins one connected to V in. We have pin 5 connected to ground and pin 3 connected to ground. We have our diode. I guess I um, Let's move it over there. All right, so we've got our diode over here. We've got test point two. Well, it says test point two, but I've called it test point three on the, on the, on the circuit. That's okay. It's over there. We've got our inductor. Actually, while we're at it. Some reason we are in wire mode. Sometimes it thinks you click it twice and then you get that little box that come up. Okay, so Let's tidy that up a little bit. Um, C2 is actually two capacitors, and we put in a we put in a bypass capacitor uh, pads in case we need them. Okay, we've got our 1K resistor. Pin four is feedback. Oh, we've forgotten to hook up our um capacitor didn't we yeah that's better yeah that looks a bit better <clears throat> okay so we have our capacitor we have instead of this resistor we have our, our little trim pot test point there and we have a test point over there which i actually haven't even got on the diagram but i want us to put one there uh, on account that you want to see exactly what's happening at pin one on the, uh, the chip perhaps and we don't we don't want to uh, to measure the input at the at the sockets because there is you know there's a trace and everything uh, in between and so on. Okay, so I think we've got it. 
So let's do a save. That's that. Now we can actually go over here and schematic is not fully annotated. Oh. Where's the annotation thing? Oh, here. Okay, well, whatever. It, ch it changed the annotations from C to A to C to A1 and C to B1. It insists on having Some reason those things moved. That will do. Okay, so now we can actually tell it to check if there's anything wrong around the ERC. And we're looking good, look at this. No errors, no warnings, no violations. So, let's do another save for good measure. Okay, so the schematic layout and design is complete. I had to insert this little piece of the video after the whole project was complete. And if you look carefully, you will see that the schematic has actually been modified and corrected the one that was used earlier um, as I've intimated in some comments was faulty uh, resistor R1 was supposed to go from pin 4 to ground which has been corrected on this particular schematic here now we can actually click on this button here or we can go back to the main screen and select the uh, PCB so we'll do it from here let's try that see how that goes so now we should be able to import this little button over here import the schematic It always makes a mess of these things. We want Jack one over here, rotate it, and move this text. Rotate that as well. So this is the input jack. So let's have a look. Ground is at the bottom. Yeah, we would like to have ground at the bottom. So that's good. Now let's the diode. And this big capacitor over here, let's rotate that. We'll just plonk it over there for now. Let's have a look. Um, I think we need to rotate that in the opposite. Yeah, that's better. So you can tell from the wretch nest here that this pin's got to go there and the ground goes over there now what i do with these things is i don't actually connect any of the grounds together i use the fill but with this button over here it's uh, i add a filled zone that goes over the whole board and that it becomes ground and then it automatically connects all the grounds together so i don't do the ground traces 
So I'm going to ignore those. Now what we need to do is this capacitor belongs to the output. Uh, this jack here belongs to the output. We also will need to rotate that like so. I just put it roughly in the area where I expect it to be. This is jack 2. I for rotate. Okay, that'll do for now. I'm not going to be worried about that. Now, one thing that we need to do is to um, take this footprint and rotate it as well. I want it like this to make the pins point downwards. I think that might be about the best we can do. So far. Okay, so I just uh, click this button over here to, to um, get the appearance manager to come. And what we want is edge cuts. We're going to select edge cuts like that. Then we're going to draw a rectangle on there. And roughly that shape like that. Okay, that will do for now. Now what I want to do is to go here. And I'm going to add a filled zone, but I like to put that Oh, hang on. Yeah, I have to select Prompt copper, copper first. I like to, to put the zone a little bit outside of those egg, egg. Oh, come on. Uh, I'm going to have a zone connected to ground. And let's have a look what else do we need to change. Solid fill. Um, I like keeping a little bit more clearance than half a millimeter. Let's say 0.75. Because, you know, we're hand soldering this thing and stuff. And we don't want solar to... And also thermal relief gap. I set it to 0.75. And everything 0 0.75. I don't know if that if we really need to give it a name, but we'll call it the ground. I think. That we're in business with that. Okay, so now we can draw a, a rectangle. Uh, 
but this uh, trackball doesn't give me quite as much control as a mouse. I think that'll do it. And then I'll go over here. Try to keep it sort of even. And then I right click on it, close outline. And now I can say, you can actually right click this thing and say fill all zones. So it has just filled in everything with ground. And you will notice that all the, the rat's nests for the grounds are all gone. And I click this button here. So we don't have to look at it. So now we, all we've got left is the, the actual connections we have to make for the signals. And the first things we want to do is, is these areas where the... <clears throat> That where I had those thick lines, remember oops, I'm in the wrong place. So remember where where the thick lines are here. I want to create some zones for those or very thick traces and things like that. Square. Board setup, I think that's, that's what it is. Let's get rid of that image there. Okay, so. Clearance we want five minimum track width. For some reason, I set the track width, but it doesn't know about it. Let me have to do it here. The size. Reason we're doing this is because we're not really going to have. We're not really going to have a VS, we're, we're only going to use a, a single sided PCB, but we might have to run a couple of wires or something. And uh, when it happens, you'll see that, that uh, happening. All right. I think you can actually define net classes and assign it to the nets, but I think this should work. Okay, so let's try that again. So if I go from here, yeah, see now we've got two millimeter traces. Do the capacitor. And we say, OK. We want mounting hole with connection. OK, that will do it. Now we were just going to get them to the 
okay we need to annotate so that's got the yeah, h1 h2 h3 and so on and ground otherwise there will be a complaint save this and over here we want to update the pcb okay so after a lot of fiddling with bits and pieces offline this is the final result for the pcb i have uh, put some extra heavy traces going to the diode and the inductor as was recommended on the data sheet <clears throat> and including the output here i have one trace on the back side but of course that's going to be a little piece of wire which will solder from this via to that via um, on account that I'm going to try to use single-sided PCB for that and um, if I was going to make a number of these things of course I would use double-sided PCB but I wouldn't be making it myself I would send it off to have it made by one of the PCB makers in any case this is a prototype so we're just going to try and use single-sided pcb so we have a complete ground plane on the on this side of the board so that is what we have i have plotted them out i uh, you can hit this button over there uh, as I've, i think i've showed bef before um, and i do two plots to uh, remind you that um, I do a positive plot which is the last one that I did on all of these the front and the back and the silk screen and um, courtyards and the fab because they can be handy I just print them out on, on a laser printer for, for reference but I also do a negative pro plot which is actually uh, mirrored and negative both as I said explained before I think um, so that the printed part of the transparency actually would be on top of the photoresist so we can't get any light bleeding through the, the transparency and uh, blurring the um, the traces so let's uh, save that we have a um, This is the uh, negative that will be used for, with the photoresist. Okay, so I have printed the negative on some overhead transparency sheets on the laser printer. Uh, as a recap, don't forget that when you are printing on the uh, clear sheets, you would want to select mirrored plot, negative plot, and you have to have the uh, front copper and to the PDF. If you don't put an output directory, it puts it in a default place. Of course, I've already done this, so I'm just going to close that. And this is the negative here got it sitting on a piece of glass so it doesn't curl up and don't forget the one of the reasons the reason we are putting it uh, as a mirrored plot is because we want to turn it upside down after it is printed because what happens is that if you don't you would have if this is the surface of the <coughs> Um, PCB and this is the clear sheet and if they print it on the top then the, there is a gap between the printing on the top and the clear sheet and a little bit of light will bleed over the edges and gets diffused by the clear sheet on the photoresist and therefore your if you got some very thin traces they will be narrower than what you intended and in some places that might even end up 
a little bit blurred or something like that. So that's undesirable. So we want this the black side to be touching the the surface of the PCB, and that is why we print it as a negative uh, reversed like that because you know this is what what the top is supposed to look like and as you can see that big capacitor is here but as we printed it it is actually over here on the other side but when we turn it over now we've got the shiny side up as you can see and the printed side which is a, a doll actually goes down onto the um, PCB now transparency film I use there's nothing special about it I got it from Amazon ages ago you can buy it anywhere either on Amazon or, or from uh, Office Depot or one of these kind of places it's just a um, overhead projection transparency film all right so I'll gather together all the chemicals and equipment that I need in order to finish our PCB we have negatives here and I've actually printed out two of them I had a look at them and my laser printer doesn't do a great job printing on this clear <clears throat> foil overhead projector sheets and I've decided I'm going to use two of them and overlap them exactly and tape them together to get a more blacker black because otherwise it won't develop properly so that's what we're going to be doing we're going to be using this light box for it that I've made for this especially for this purpose and also to use as a studio light and I've got a video on how I built this thing out of scrap wood and bits and pieces from uh, an old TV and so on and a few LEDs and a little pulse fit modulator thing I got on Aliexpress anyway um, <clears throat> We have our we have our light here, a 10 watt UV light, 395 to 400 nanometers, and I've got a little cage here that came out of an old PC. It's actually a, a little hard drive cage, which I use in order to support this light. I put some little Velcro tabs on there and it just oops it just sits on the top like that so we should line it up a bit better so you can see and i put the you know the pcb with the negatives on the top supported by a few little pieces of glass that i got from an old picture frame and that seems to do the job I went to the hardware store and got some lye, which is actually sodium hydroxide, which we use to um, develop the PCB. You can also use washing soda apparently, but you have to use a lot more of it. And I got some ordinary paint stripper here that I use in order to clear off the developed photoresist. I have some ferric chloride here in powder form that I dilute with some water to etch the PCB. I still like using ferric chloride. Some people are using um, hydrochloric acid and, and with some other chemicals and so on, hydrogen peroxide, which probably works as well, but I'm old school, you could say. And I've got a little tray here, which is actually left over from an old frozen meal, but it's nice because it's got two compartments and one is little big enough for the board um, so the next thing to do now is to go and get the little PCB it's been drying overnight so as you can see when I got this on the light box here that I, I printed this one I told the printer to use extra toner and to um, so it's a little bit darker but it's not dark enough you can still see especially the the big black areas to the you can see through the black area there are little dots and things and this one is actually even a little bit worse probably you can see it it's grainy 
so we are going to put them on top of each other so they can help each other out and in order to do that I'll use a little bit of tape and get some scissors here And that's a little bit of sticky tape oh, I just hold it down by one of the corners here okay that lines up there I think that is pretty good. It's one side done. And the other side, it's going to be. I'm going to be sitting on the thing there with a piece of glass on the top like that. Let's push it down so we should be in business. Okay. So we're going to set up here. I have the circuit diagram for reference over here. I have a P12 tip soldering iron here with a wet sponge. I like having both. I've got my Atan soldering iron here, which is a, this is the low powered one, the 50 watt one, uh, for some of those little surface mount components. Uh, and of course I've got my little um, brass thing over there for cleaning the soldering iron. I have different kinds of flux here. I don't expect to have to use this. Possibly this is rosin fl flux that dissolved in alcohol. Uh, there's my solder and I've got some Amtec flux which um, I do expect to use and I have it the board here set up in a a little holder like so <clears throat> so let's get started all right so I think the first thing I want to do is to get this chip mounted up and I'm going to put some flux on the board here where that chip goes actually I'm going to put some flux over here as well because these are the little surface two surface mount components that we might as well do next Of course, I'm using leaded solar here, and leaded stuff is evil. All right. this down and get one of these pins here soldered up like so so now it should be relatively solid which then allows us to okay <clears throat> Let 
Let's have a look what we've got. Checking if all the pins are solid. They are mounted nicely. I saw the solder going, creeping in between the chip there. So that should be that. Now, I'm going to switch to this small soldering iron. And the first thing we're going to be doing so I'm reference, referencing this little overlay that I've made. And as you can see, there's a 1K resistor over there, which is this patch here. So what I tend to do is I put some solder on one side of the pad. And then we get the component. like that so that's one side done i on purposely don't put solder on the other side so that that will lay flat on the boards and i can just solder it up like so so that's one that's done and same for this little capacitor that's going to go over there It's so small it sticks to the tweezers. Let me make sure that there's nothing on the tweezers. Then. Come on. It's really tricky doing those little guys. I normally don't move that over there. Use such small components, but I just this is all I had at that for that particular value. Okay. Gonna rotate this for a sec so I can get access to it a bit easier. I think that's good enough. Okay, so much for our little surface mount components. So that was the little 10 nanofarad capacitor. Very good. Now, the rest of the components. Uh, actually going on the other side of the circuit board, most of them. So given that that is the case, I might as well clean off the, the flux. Yeah, that's our surface mount components done. All right, now, this big capacitor here, that is um, C1 on the circuit. It goes here. And the positive side goes to this hole here. 
but as I said, it's we're going to put it on the other side. Like so, double check that the positive side is over here, negative side is here. I'll just slightly splay out these pins just a tiny bit so it just can hang there. And I will add a little bit of flux because I these are used components and the little legs on them probably a little bit corroded or something. I salvaged them from somewhere. That's the uh, soldering done. A little bit of clean up of the flux and stuff. Okay, now I'm going to set up for testing. Okay, so I'll put some little standoffs on this thing here so it can stand up. And we're going to make up some little leads to plug into those sockets so we can start testing. Okay, so we have our little buck regulator built up and we're ready for testing but not all is well for some reason the adjustments are not working this is it here and that's the adjuster I have checked the circuit everything appears to be connected up correctly but what we are seeing is no change in output voltage so let's turn on the input supply. So we are giving it uh, 10 volts and I'm going to draw a half an amp out of it. And I have actually a oscilloscope connected to the output and we are seeing 1.1 volts on the output and if we turn the adjuster here there is just well I found a mistake, didn't I? I goofed up. I'm a goofball. Remember when we were looking at the circuit that I drew up here? You see that a resistor over here, that 1K resistor? It actually comes from pin 4. It was supposed to come from pin 4 over there and go to that resistor. But if you look at the circuit over here, what I actually input is, I put it on the wrong side of that um, 
trim pot. See, I put it. I put it on this side of the trim pot instead of on that side. It's supposed to go. It's supposed to um, go over here. Anyway, I fixed it. And so let's have a look what we what we've got. Turn on the electronic load. Turn on the power supply. So this is this is what you get when it, the electronic load is actually off. There is um, this is on test point three, which is actually the um, the output pin two on the. on the chip so what you can actually see here is that it's outputting a pulse but it's it's letting the inductor just ring like that however if I turn the power on this is the output now and I got a set for half an amp and if I actually change the voltage you can see the pulse width modulation happening it loses its um, trigger at some stage but so now it's set to eight and a half volts and let's have a look if I can get it to look. No, it's too hard. As you can see on the uh, screen there, it's got these little runty ringing going on. But in any case, this is how it works uh, the lowest it can go is 1.1 volts really and I, I'm feeding it with 10, 10 volts of course and then the highest it can go is 8.665 volts Except unless I feed it with a bit more voltage let's try 12 volts So at 12 volts, you can go from 1.2 to 10.6. You can just barely see it going low. Now let's have a look. What's the frequency of this thing? Fifty two kilohertz, it says. Any case, it is working though. Now, what happens if I 
tell it to draw more current. This is now one amp. Two amps. Now this um, chip is supposed to be able to do three amps. Yeah, it'll do it. No, it won't. It's sm smoking. And it's not the chip, it's the little, um, it's the, the little inductor that is um, overheating. This guy here. That's all I had, but it's no wonder that they put this much bigger inductor on this board here. Okay, so we're going to be testing for a ripple on this um, <clears throat> little power supply that we built. I replaced the inductor here with a much larger one, but in any case, we got the load set up. We've got the power supply set up there, which we will be turning on in due course. So what we've done is we have connected our oscilloscope probe directly to the underneath the output bypass capacitor. And we're using this little springy thingy in, to connect to ground so we have removed this great big lead that normally connects to here for, for ground because that's going to act as an antenna and pick up all sorts of noise, especially from LED lights and things that I have around the place. So to avoid that, we have uh, connected it like this. I soldered on a few little wires to connect them to. Uh, and as I said, the it's got a power inductor on there now, so that should be able to handle up to 3 amps. In any case, we are interested in Ripple. So I'm going to be setting that up and looking at it on the oscilloscope. Okay, here we are. We've got the Regal MSO 5000 series oscilloscope connected via HDMI to my PC and OBS studio so we can actually record the screen which is nice so I do not have to aim a camera at it and with all the glare and things that you normally get in those situations. I also have a mouse connected to it as you can see I can um, actually run the oscilloscope using the mouse I don't have to push buttons and stuff like that which is also nice. At the top left hand corner I actually overlaid the voltage display of my small digital multimeter there so I got that connected directly to the load and so we can actually see what voltage we're seeing and everything just for reference and I have uh, the oscilloscope probe, as you saw, is connected via that little springy thingy, and <clears throat> which means we don't have a ground loop there to pick up noise and things that we would otherwise see and think that it might come from the power supply, but it does not. So uh, the bandwidth of the probe is 35 megahertz. That's important if you're using a, a cheap oscilloscope. You might find that it has less than 20 megahertz bandwidth on the times one probe which means you couldn't use it for doing this test properly the ripple and noise 
tests are normally done with a bandwidth of 20 megahertz. So the first, therefore, the first thing what, that we are going to do is to set the bandwidth limit to 20 megahertz. Conveniently, that is provided there. We will couple AC because we only worried about the noise and stuff like that. Attenuation, as I said, set to one times. Now, this oscilloscope has some features here, like you can actually set an offset, and which means you could actually use DC input and set an offset of whatever voltage that you've got there, like say 5 volts, and then you can see, but there is no point to actually uh, do that. However, this oscilloscope also has a nice feature where we can actually tell us what we're doing. We're actually inter interested in ripple, and in order to do that, we will go to the uh, acquire and uh, measure features of the oscilloscope. So the first thing that we will do is we will set the acquisition to peak, like so. And then next, we will go to the measure facility here, and we will be going to turn on a few things that we are interested in. We are interested in frequency and we are interested in voltage RMS and we're interested in voltage peak to peak. Okay, that will do that. And then we are going to analyze and we are going to go to power analyzer and we are going to go to analysis type and we are going to say a ripple. Now this uh, power quality test is a special test, but we can only do that if we have differential probes. But ripple we can do, <clears throat> and interestingly enough, this oscilloscope gives us a diagram of how you would set that up. So you have some sort of uh, this is a you know, pulse width modulated switch mode power supply. Now we don't actually have this kind. We got a buck regulator, but it's similar in concept really. Uh, we have a diode and a, uh, an inductor and a capacitor, and so we just connect that to the output, to the oscilloscope, which is what we have. So let's turn the display on, and we will get some information there as well. Okay, so we are connected to our little buck regulator here that we have designed and built, and we're running it at a half an amp, 500 milliamps right now, and we are at 5 volts. I have determined that if I turn the voltage up to 10 volts, the ripple actually becomes a little less. <clears throat> so we're going to be testing at 5 volts which is most likely what I would use this thing for to produce 5 volts, you know, for some TTL chips or something like that. So that seems to be a good voltage to measure at. We're looking at the ripple here. Let's reset. So 
So we have a ripple peak to peak at 500 milliamps, half an amp at 150, 160 on average. We have about 24, 25 millivolts RMS. Now let's put it up to one amp. Now the chip is actually supposed to be rated at three amps, but I have run it at two and a half amps and determined that it actually gets quite hot and the inductor that I'm using too actually gets quite hot. So I've actually ordered some, this is the surface mount um, LM2596 but there are TO220 types as well that you can actually put a heatsink on and I suspect that if you are going to be drawing three amps you really want one of those with a heatsink on it. So I've ordered one of those. I've also ordered some toroid inductors that are supposedly specially made for the LM2596 it's, and they're rated at six amps so we are going to rebuild this circuit in a future video and I'm going to put some extra filtering on there and we're going to see what how good we can actually make this thing but this is what we have right now and I'm drawing one amp and that is I'm going to be using as a reference 5 volts at one amp and so we have average now 221 millivolts and we have 30 millivolts let's say RMS now we're going to try the little commercial one that I have the cheap Chinese thing and see how that compares so hold on I'll connect it up Okay, here is our little Chinese buck converter with the same chip on it. And what we're going to be doing is underneath here, they actually made the PCB so that it can be connected. You can actually put a surface mount or a true hole component on there. So we're actually going to connect our little probe like so into these little holes here and so we will avoid this ground loop by using this um, by not connecting it to these to these ones here so I'll connect that up and we will have a look what we get okay so here <coughs> we are measuring at one amp we see it's actually set to five volts but when we when we set it to to draw one amp the voltage goes down to 4.92 volts we have let me um, reset the statistics Okay, 133.6. There's my pencil. At one amp and 31 millivolts. It's interesting how this waveform is quite different. It is like a, a little triangle waveform and it seems to have double the frequency than what the chip is running on. <laughs> anyway, so let's have a look.
one and a half amps. We are now at 150 millivolts, 154, 2 amps, hundred and sixty six odd millivolts. Two and a half amps. Oh no, actually this this would have to be less. If this is a hundred and twenty, we were we were getting two hundred and twenty one, didn't we? But we had thirty millivolts RMS and here we got twenty eight millivolts RMS. It's because the waveform is a little different, it has more peaks in it. So it carries more power, I guess. All right, well, that is what we have. And as I said, I've got some better components on order, and we are going to go and build another one of these things with more heavy-duty components on it and some extra filtering. And we will see what we end up with, if we can improve on this. All right, so what we have learned is that we need a good heavy duty toroidal, preferably inductor. We need to get really low ESR capacitors to filter out that noise and ripple that we saw. And even on those cheap Chinese ones, there is insufficient filtering there, in my opinion at uh, 120 odd millivolts is too much. The one we made had 200 odds over 200 millivolts, which is way too much. So we need to do better. As I said, I've ordered some better components and I do believe we were quite successful with the version two of it. And also that one includes the more of how to make the PCBs, how to put on the um, photoresist, how to develop it and all that sort of stuff, which I took out of the version one because the version two a video uh, had a better description of it. So I decided this video was already too long. Anyway, I hope you will watch the version two. It, um, looks like that, that first stage, and you will see that we were much more successful in that one. Anyway, hit the uh, like, subscribe and bell and all that kind of stuff that would help me along quite nicely, and I will see you guys later.